All right, so it's 406 and I am gonna jump right in. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this presentation. Um, my name is Rashida Rattray, and I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the Connecticut Fair Housing Center. For those of you who may not know about the Connecticut Fair Housing Center, we are a statewide private civil rights nonprofit with the mission to ensure that all people here in the state of Connecticut have equal access to housing, free from discrimination. To further that mission, I do a lot of work re rooted in educating people about the Fair Housing Act and empowering them to be able to identify and report housing discrimination. The purpose of this presentation is to bring attention to negative perceptions of individuals that live in public housing and to aid in reducing that barrier to fair housing. We will also explore the concept of nimbyism and how this viewpoint has perpetuated these negative perceptions. We are also hoping to empower individuals to organize among themselves and support organizations that are working to promote equity in their communities. So that was a lot. So let's do a little bit of level setting. What exactly is fair housing? And why is there an entire agency dedicated to making sure that fair housing is recognized? Fair housing is the right to choose housing, free from unlawful discrimination. Federal and state fair housing laws were put in place to protect people from discrimination in housing transactions, such as rentals, sales, lending, and insurance. Fair housing ensures access for everyone and is an integral ingredient to ensuring housing equity, making it possible for all people to live wherever they can afford to live. It guarantees that regardless of your age, race, religion, family situation, or level of ability, you have the right to choose the housing that is best for your needs with no outside preferences or stereotypes being imposed on you. The other thing that the Fair Housing Act does is promote integration. Here in the state of Connecticut, 67% of the population of color lives in 8% of Connecticut's towns. That fact proves that there is still segregation here in our state, which means there's still a great deal of work that we have to do. That brings us to our viewing of episode five of the HBO miniseries, Show Me a Hero. This miniseries, which is based off the book by one of our panelists, Lisa Belkin, explores the affordable housing crisis that shook Yonkers, New York in the late 1980s. The U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division brought a case against the city of Yonkers, New York, alleging that the city had intentionally segregated its schools by deliberately concentrating public housing in the southwest end of Yonkers. The city of Yonkers was then ordered to remedy the housing portion of its violations by adopting a plan for building up to 1,000 units of low and moderate income housing in predominantly white neighborhoods. The responses of the residents of those predominantly white neighborhoods were vehement. It is here that we get a taste of NIMBYism, which is an acronym for the phrase, not in my backyard, a term used to describe people, typically existing residents, especially homeowners, who oppose new housing development near their homes, particularly denser or more affordable housing. Episode five picks up where the residents of public housing are applying to live in newly built affordable housing units, and it truly highlights their journey towards attaining safe and stable housing. Our panel discussion will follow the viewing of the episode. And now that all that level setting is done, I want to redirect everyone to one of the main questions that I want we, us all to keep in mind. Let's call a spade a spade here, right? How does NIMBYism perpetuate the racist and poverty stigmas that people in public housing are facing? Before we start this viewing, I would like to caution that there's some strong language used in this episode, so please be aware of that. Also, we do not own the rights to this episode and we are using it only for educational purposes. With no further ado, I want to present to you all episode five of Show Me. And we are back. I hope everyone was able to enjoy that episode. This happens to be my favorite episode. Um, I believe it's such a powerful portrayal of all sides of the house, affordable housing crisis that was being faced by the city of Yonkers. 
Um, and you had the opportunity to see so many different stigmas exemplified from poverty to disability and the fear of the unknown. So I love this episode so much. Um, and I'm hoping that everyone enjoyed it. So now we're going to be moving into our panel discussion. Um, right now we have um, one panelist that is called in. Um, Maribel is actually on the line that I have here. So um, when we get to her, she'll be able to answer her questions, but had a little bit of technical difficulties with Zoom. But with no further ado, I am excited to present our panel to you this evening. We are joined by Lisa Belkin, the author of Show Me a Hero, A Tale of Murder, Suicide, Race, and Redemption. This is the book that inspired the series. We're also joined by Anika Singh Lamar, a clinical professor at, at Yale, uh, Yale Law School, where she teaches community and economic development clinic. Dion Dwyer, the president of resident council at PT Partners. PT Partners is a grassroots resident-led community organization um, that is a nonprofit that aims to rebuild community in PT Barnum Apartments, a low-income public housing development in Bridgeport, Connecticut. PT Partners also aims to um, develop partnerships with community leaders and organizations and to attract the funding and resources necessary to enable PT Barnum apartment residents to proactively engage in making their neighborhood a healthy and safe place to live. We are also joined on by phone by Maribel Batances, who is a resident leader at PT Partners. So let's start this panel off with a question for Lisa. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for inspiring the book that inspired this episode. <laughs> thank you for, for um, you know, there's a piece of my my heart in that, that book. So thank you for sharing it with everyone. Thank you so much. So getting right into it, tell us a little bit about what led you to write Show Me a Hero. Okay, so I came into this story, interestingly, at that lottery. Um, I live slightly north of Yonkers, just up the sawmill in Dobbs Ferry. Um, and I had recently moved into um, my house. This was now <laughs> 30 some odd years ago. And um, I had read about the Yonkers housing fight. Um, I was not living in the New York area while it was actually happening in 1988. And so I moved into my house, the one I'm in right now, um, in 1991 and started reading about, there was this settlement, there was this housing, they were building this housing, people were going to move in. And one day I saw a small article in, in the Yonkers paper, which we got um, that said there was going to be a lottery. If there hadn't been a lottery, I don't know that I ever would have written anything. There was something so compelling about the idea of literally leaving this to fate, you know, a bingo drum. I was a reporter. I, I spent most of my career at the New York Times and I was a magazine writer. I was looking for a magazine piece. I thought, you know, a few months work and, and meet a few people. So let's go see this lottery and see how I, you know, how it shakes out. Um, where they filmed the lottery was the actual gym um where the lottery was held and so i walked into that gym in the pouring rain i will tell you that david simon was really good with fact and you know it rained that night and there was a rain machine when they filmed the scene and what you don't see in the the what we just watched was i was there the day they were filming this and all the actual characters, all the people who you saw portrayed in that scene, the actual people were all lining the back wall watching them film the scene that was the scene that started me on this whole, what turned into this book. So it was, you know, just re-watching that is emotional uh, for me. And you know, and then I met all the people who were the main characters I met that night. Um, it's one of the few times they have all been in the same place in their life was the night of the lottery. And then when they all showed up the, the day of the filming 
And I followed them and I realized you can't find out what happens next in a couple of weeks. Uh, you need years to see whether or not this works and what, what their transition to this new side of town was like. So it became a book and um, I met them in 92. The book came out in 99. I knew a good deal about both their, the adjustment of the new residents and the, um, the adjustment of the neighbors who had been living there before the housing went in. So the book became about all of that. That is amazing. It's so crazy how sometimes these little projects that we think are not going to take over our whole lives kind of just take form and, and you know, become so impactful. Um, so you mentioned earlier um, that you interacted with the individuals that inspired the characters of the miniseries. What is something that you learned about their experience that you didn't know prior to writing your book? I knew nothing. Uh, about public housing, um, you know, I, maybe a little more than the average human being because I spent a career as a journalist covering, you know, social issues writ large. So maybe I, I knew a little bit more, but, you know, Mary Dorman in the miniseries, the white woman who's sort of recruited um, is, the you know the, the filmmakers and I guess mine is the book writers eyes of the person who knows nothing right um I was not Mary Dorman in that I did not come in with with the hatred the disdain I you know would never have protested against the housing if anything I I like to think that my worldview is such that I would have protested for. I mean, so I'm not Mary, but that scene where she goes into the apartment buildings for the first time, um, it's a tricky scene to pull off as filmmakers because it could look like, you know, the the white lady realizing, oh my God, you know, they, they live just like us. Um, on the other hand, that's kind of what Mary realized. And with all its naivete and all its ridiculousness, this was the first time it occurred to her that these people that she had been fighting against, who she'd never met, um, not a single person in this group of people, that all they wanted was a house like hers. Um, you know, all, all they wanted was a life that where people would leave them alone. Um, so it was, I had some of that experience, I like to think not quite as, as you know, stereotypically, if you will. Um, but I learned a lot about what it's like to be in public housing and to have your life, you know, to be treated like a child who lives under all these rules and the, to be assumed that you are going to screw up or make trouble. And that is, you know, the uh, assumption at least of Yonkers public housing at that moment in time. Now things have changed since 1988 in some places, but you know, I had never really thought about it. So yes, I, in some ways, that was also my journey. The, okay, I have, I've brought a lot of baggage to this that I now have to unpack and get rid of in order to tell the story of the new residents, um, you know, as, as a white girl from Dobbs Ferry. I can understand the challenges with that. And, you know, those assumptions that, you know, we've seen that you mentioned earlier and that we've seen portrayed in, you know, the retelling of this, those assumptions are, are why this conversation or one of the reasons why this conversation is so important. And um, I know that we talked about this question previously, but I, I just, I know everybody wants to hear your answer to this. So who do you believe are the heroes in Show Me a Hero, and why? It, it, it is the question, and I'm so glad you landed on it because to me, that's kind of the, the soul of the book is, you know, the title is Show Me a Hero. Um, and I always, when I go and talk about it, I'll turn it around to the audience and say, you know, okay, so who was the hero? 
and I get a lot of Nick Osisco, who, you know, you don't see all of his journey. Um, it does not end well. And he, you know, he came in thinking he really wanted to play mayor and he ended up having to grow up and actually figure out how to be a leader. And so, yes, in many ways he was a hero. And that one line that is in this episode, which is, you know, a hero is something that other people call you. You can't use it to describe yourself. Um, and so th that, that to me is so resonant of the entire story, that heroism is not a thing you stand up and declare. Um, you know, some people think that Mary was heroic and that she faced her, her prejudices and changed her mind. And in fact, and you don't see it in that episode, became a fierce, staunch advocate of the housing, became, you know, close friends with many of the women who are in that one scene. Um, you know, and when I... When I gave Mary the pages to fact check when the book was in manuscript form and she wrote me and I thought, oh, Mary will love this. Mary comes off, you know, smelling like roses. And she wrote me a long double space to, you know, every side of the page letter about how I had betrayed her and how I, there were things that she didn't do and things she didn't say. And, and that was not her. And I went to Mary's house, which is the actual house that you saw in the miniseries, is Mary Dorman's actual house. And um, we went through all my notes, every conversation, every event, so I could show her where I got it from. And Mary looked at me at the end and said, Lisa, I owe you an apology. I accused you of things you didn't do. And it's just that... I'm not that woman anymore, and I don't like her very much. So there were people who see that as a hero's journey, but my answer was always from, from almost the day of that, that lottery was the people who moved, the people who picked up and moved across town to a place where they were not wanted, where people had been fighting their arrival for 10 years where you know they almost bankrupted their city rather than have this handful of new neighbors um and i don't know that i would have had it in me to walk into that with my children um and they didn't do it for themselves they did it for their kids and yeah so that's to me, that's who the hero is. That's who the hero has always been. I absolutely agree with you. And in these episodes, I encourage everyone, if you haven't watched the full series or you haven't purchased the book, please, please do so. The series honestly changed so many things about the way I view, you know, public housing and the fight for affordable housing. And it also, you know, shook me, it made me think, it made me angry at some points. At some points, it made me really sad. And I think it's worthwhile for everyone to um, experience this in its fullness, right? We only showed you episode five, but there are six episodes in the mini series and I'm encouraging um, each of you, it's on HBO Max. If possible, definitely try to watch the whole series because it is amazingly done. And Lisa, we wanna thank you so much for being here and for you know all the work that you've done to get us to this point where we did a viewing on this episode and we're having this conversation. Well, I'm Thank here you. selfishly because my my knowledge of housing is fairly old, right? I, I know a lot about what happened in Yonkers up until 1999. So I'm here because I want to know what's going on now. So, um, you know, and to hear what everyone else says. So thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Thank you. And with that, I'm a little selfish myself. So I'm going to move on to someone that has some great expertise in housing and housing related issues. Um, we're going to kick the next question that we have to Anika. Anika, thank you so much for joining us this Happy evening. <laughs> All right. So the first question, what is NIMBYism? Because we've thrown this term around a little bit tonight, but what is NIMBYism and how does it show up in your work? Yeah, you know, thanks, um, Rashida, for having me, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. 
I rewatched the whole miniseries over the weekend with my um, almost 13 year old. Um, and it was actually a pretty good introduction to what mommy does for a living. So I'm sort of sad to say to Lisa that I think even if some of she feels like some of her information is dated, it's, this is still so very real and current. Um, so NIMBY is an acronym that stands for not in my backyard. Um, and it is oftentimes, it historically was used to describe um, people not wanting to see like actual bad things in their neighborhood, like landfills or like environmental issues. Um, but uh, in our, well, it's not, it's today, but as you can see from the mini series, it's also um, uh, 30 years ago and it's also 30 years before that. It, it's, it, NIMBY has, NIMBYism has become a phenomenon that we've also seen applied to housing. Um, yes, affordable housing as in subsidized housing, but also oftentimes to just straight up multifamily apartment housing or even smaller single family homes on small lots. And the reason that we see um, those kinds of objections to new housing, um, they, I mean, they, they sort of fall into a couple different buckets. Um, so one, as we're talking about today is stigma and stereotyping of people who live in public housing. So when you're talking about affordable housing um, in particular, um, but you see that kind of NIMBYism even with multifamily housing in towns where um, the average homeowner today is, the average resident today is a homeowner. Um, and they look down on renters in general, or they look down on people who bought, who would need a smaller starter home to become a homeowner in general. Um, they think it'll affect the property tax base, that there'll be less property taxes coming in. They think it'll affect the population of the school district so that their kids will be going to school with kids of parents who are not as educated or wealthy or whatever. Um, uh, and the result is that you have these hurdles to building housing that create a huge problem for housing supply um, and result in where we're at in you know, where, where we are in Connecticut today, which is that the market is lacking hundreds of thousands of moderately priced housing units, um, uh, and the result is overcrowding, um, homelessness, et cetera, all of those problems that we we live with. Yeah, we definitely do have a considerable amount of issues um, when it comes to affordable housing and just housing in general um, here in the state of Connecticut and unfortunately countrywide. So Anika, you attend a lot of public hearings in your line of work. What is your experience like when you attend and what are some of the things you hear at public hearings? Yeah, so I will read, you know, do do a real no-no on a webinar like this and read to you from some public facing documents or um, uh, of quotes from things that we've heard when I, for public, for public hearings that I've done for projects of mine. Um, you know, in our work, we, most of our clients are community organizations in New Haven, but we also represent folks who are trying to build affordable housing in suburban Connecticut. Um, and so the quotes that I'll read from you are from those hearings. So, um, um, places that are uh, more like Poundridge, where Judge Sand lives, than they are like um, Yonkers, but very similar rhetoric. Um, you know, the uh, so I'll, I will read some of those quotes in a second, but I think it's important to say at the outset, you know, pulling away from just the quotes, is that there is now research on this question of who shows up to these public hearings on housing development. and. Um, it turns out that people who show up to these hearings tend to be whiter than the average citizen. They are older, they are wealthier, and they are more opposed to new housing development. The researchers who did this were actually able to, able to compare testimony at land use hearings with a vote on a referendum that was happening at the same time on Massachusetts 40B, which is a statute like Connecticut's 8-30G, which is an anti-exclusionary zoning statute. And they found that if you sort of took those as rough indicators of people's support for housing, that the people who showed up for the public hearings were just way more opposed to housing than even their neighbors were, right? Like even the generally white, generally well-off people they lived with, um, these hearings attract a certain sort. Like you have to feel really strongly about this stuff to bother to show up at like eight o'clock on a Tuesday night or whatever, like get a babysitter, 
go to the town hall. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a lift to do that. So you're going to be somebody who feels really strongly about it. And the fact of the matter is that most people don't feel that strongly about this stuff. And the people who do feel strongly about it, oftentimes are just like super paranoid and worried about um, changes in their neighborhood. So I'll read you some quotes. These are, I'm not gonna sort of specify which is which as I'm reading, but these are from applications that my clinic worked on, one in Brantford, Connecticut, and one in Woodbridge, Connecticut, both are which are well off, um, disproportionately white suburbs of New Haven. Um, so sorry, and I apologize. Um, I'm gonna read these and there's some of them are terrible. So um, the problem is that you shouldn't be mixed in with low income or section eight people that brings a different element to the town. Who's gonna police what kind of caliber of residents are living in there? They might have six or seven people per unit living in there, sort of assuming that things would be crowded. Um, I have no objection to renovating that whole place and making it nice for retirees, disabled, old people, but don't get too much of that riffraff. Um, they're getting out of the city where the crime and drugs and everything else are. Um, we're here as the Brantford Housing Authority, not the New Haven Housing Authority. It's a public housing low-income project, and no matter what you call it, it is what it is. Um, Brantford residents have okayed themselves to pay more taxes so we could live away from where we don't want to live. Um, that's one, one bucket. And then another, once you have multi, now this other one was not specifically about public housing. So just keep that in mind. So people are still saying, once you have multifamily dwellings, the complexion of the town will change forever. Other people raised concerns about criminal acts, drug dealing and domestic disputes. Um, somebody said, to invite low-income residents in multifamily dwellings threatens those qualities that made Woodbridge attractive and would invite a myriad of social pathologies that Woodbridge has so far been spared. People talked about trailer parks, boarding houses used for transient dwellers and homeless shelters. Um, so you can sort of see the um, assemblage of code words. They're largely code words. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the kinds of tropes that people are bringing up are things that, you know, various courts have, you know, Yonkers is one case of many, right? Courts were, have said, yeah, we are able to read between the lines here. Like we get it. When you're talking about overcrowding, we know that those are stereotypes about immigrant families, for example, right? Um, uh, um, but nevertheless, it's, it's just so common. It's like simultaneously illegal and super commonplace, unfortunately. That is, I, I had a very hard time containing my facial expressions while you were reading those quotes because normally I'm very good at that, but you know, it was the code words, right? And, and the code phrases and, you know, going on about the public hearings as well, you know, sometimes it's, it's I, I could almost think that it might be a little bit intentional, right? Because what working family is going to be able to get to a public hearing that starts at 8 p.m. that could transcend past 11 p.m., right? Could go to midnight, right? So unfortunately, working families don't have that type of flexibility within their schedule to be able to attend those public hearings sometimes. And those are the voices that really need to be heard, right? Because those are the people who are truly a part of the community. So wow, that was, that was vehement. That was really, really not shocking, but shocking at the same time. Yes. So how do you believe these negative perceptions, or if we just call a spade a spade again, this racist perception of people in public housing contributes to barriers that we are seeing in fair housing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are... Um... There are, we have, we've got a fundamental problem where we've given people who live in given neighborhoods, basically veto authority over any new housing ever going up in those neighborhoods. And if you're gonna build housing, um, you know, close to tr trains and buses and close to jobs and, where there's existing sewers and other kind of infrastructure, you're gonna end up building housing where there's already housing. There's no other way really to do it. Um, and we do need additional housing in this state. Um, we also have a massive segregation problem in this, in this state, right? Um, and it's not just that we have 
neighborhoods that are black and labor neighborhoods that are Latino and neighborhoods that are white, it's that we divvy up resources um, um, unfairly among those neighborhoods, right? So we spend lots more money on um, kids' education in um, certain neighborhoods. We sort of concentrate goodies where there are white households. So these are these are big these are big problems and it's not a complete solution, but one part of the solution has got to be additional housing um, in places where there's already infrastructure and where there are lots of resources. Um, and the people in those neighborhoods um, are going to have a lot of self-interest against seeing the units of housing. They're just, it's going to be completely self-interested um, from, I don't wanna have to deal with a crowd at the playground to, um, I don't want you know additional taxpayers in my town whose property isn't worth that much to racism, right? Like there's a huge range of types of self-interest, but nevertheless, they're self-interested in one direction, which is against that. And we've got to take some of the decision-making power out of their out of their hands. I don't think there's a solution set here that doesn't include um, state interaction in decision making around where housing goes. Um, and particularly on those zoning decisions, but also on situating where um, public housing goes. I completely and totally agree with you, especially we often say in our 100 years of fair housing history presentation, it's those resources and who gets to access those resources is what truly shapes our communities. So yeah, definitely taking the decision-making power and spreading it, right? Not keeping it where it is right now, because clearly that that's not working working out in our benefit. Thank you so much for that, Anika, and thank you for sharing your um, expertise. So we're gonna move on to um, Dion and Maribel. Um, Dion, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Maribel, I have you here on the line. Um, so Dion, I'm gonna start with you. Tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming the president of Resident Council for PT Partners. Um, so I am a resident of PT Barnum and that is a low-income public housing um, community. And so I am the president of resident council of the community. Um, I originally was a resident leader, uh, started a few years back, I wanna say about six or so. And then, um, and that's when PT Partners first started. And, um, Fast forward to a few, a few years later, I wanna say top of 2020, I was actually also vice president of resident council before I became president. And so the, the president at the time had moved out of the community. So we didn't have a president anymore. So we did a, an election to elect a new council, a resident council person. And so I became the president at that time. Um, so, and I also am, um, been living here for almost 20 years in PT Barnum. So becoming a resident leader was very gradual. Um, I just started out becoming, coming to a meeting that I heard was for the residents, by the residents. And from there, I became interested in a lot of things that was being talked about because I wanted to see how I can make things better um, not just for the community, but also for my children who are attending the school in the neighborhood. Thank you so much, Dion. And Maribel, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming resident leader at PT Partners? Um, I came to Bridgeport in December of 2017 when I moved to the Green, Charles Green Homes. Two years later, I started volunteering with PT Partners, and so far, I've been doing okay. Now I want to do resident leader at the Green Homes, trying to get um, the residents to become more um, together and do for our Green Homes. And um, so far, it's working out good. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Maribel. 
So this next question, um, I'm going to start with you again, Dion. What is your experience with NIMBYism? Hmm. Um, I have a lot of those, but I want to say one in particular is the fact that this community is living close to a um, industrial factory section, and it has a few different ones. It's got the water pollution treatment center. Um, it also has a garbage recycling um, factory. And I do believe that there is a, a, some adjacent to a concrete crushing factory. And that one in particularly, I remember because we did a campaign in it, I want to say back in 2016 or 17 where their, their concrete crushing um, uh, process was in another neighborhood, uh, close to the park, the waters, the better neighborhood. <laughs> and they were protesting for it to be moved where they were gonna move it to our neighborhood. So I just thought that was, um, when I didn't even know what nimbism was, when I did find out, that's what my um, my memory flashed back to, because they didn't want it in their backyard, but it was okay to put it in ours. So that was like a double whammy for me. Wow, that is that is so impactful because it's not good enough for here, but it's good enough for there, right? Awful. So exactly. one of the one of the things that. I really want to highlight and one of the questions that I, um, I I battled with asking, but I feel like it is it's integral for me to ask this question. So, Dion, what are the needs of people that live in public housing? Well, I'm glad you did ask that, Rashida. It is a very important question. It really is. Um, and it's necessary. I think it is because um, with the stigma that people have for the residents that live in low-income housing, it, it, they seem to think that we're different somehow, that we're not people, that we live a different lives and we don't deserve better. But, and I've said this before in so many other different places that I've managed to be in, you know, in the seat of, uh, in front of, um, different capacities. And as I always said that, you know, everybody in this world that we live, this little globe that is turning around the sun, literally wants the same thing. We all want the same thing. We all want to live a comfortable life. We want decent and safe homes. We want resources for our children. The children that we are growing up to become part of this world again. So therefore they are our legacy. So therefore they need to have the resources that we need as well. So we all want that same end goal. We all wanna be comfortable. We all wanna live good lives. We all wanna be able to raise our family safely. So I agree. the needs of people, period, whether you live in low-income houses or not. Absolutely agree with you. Maribel, is there anything that you want to add in on this question of what are the needs of individuals that live in public housing? No, I think Dion has said it all. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maribel. And I agree. Um, that question was to highlight that the needs of individuals that live in public housing are the needs of all of us. We all have the desire to live in safe, stable, affordable housing. And that you know, the needs shouldn't be different just because of where a person is located. Um, so for this question, um, it's more of like a group, a whole group kind of discussion that we can have here with this one. Um, so how are you working to influence change when it comes to these negative perceptions or the racism towards people who live in public housing? And any one of you can start, pop on and kind of, you know, share an answer to that. Um, so let me start because one of the th most important things that I forgot to say as far as uh, me being a resident leader 
um, not just the president of resident council of this community, but I'm also since last year uh, started a new role as system change fellow with PT partners. So what that is, is I, I have the ability to be able to sit at the table where the local laws and policies are being made or changed. Um, it now becomes necessary or also absolutely um, important for the community to be a part of the conversations with all the laws that are being changed locally and or being made. And so my role enables me to not just speak for the community, but also make sure they are a part of the conversation when it comes to that. So I would like to think that that is how I am uh, making sure those changes are being made. Agreed, agreed. Um, Anika, Lisa, feel free to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think what, so in, in addition to um, representing individual um, housing developers, one thing the clinic does is work on um, uh, legislative and policy change, both federally and state level and also at the local level. Um, and I think that the, um, you know, housing policy in this country and racism and segregation are so intimately intertwined that it's impossible um, to address housing really without um, um, to address housing issues without tangling with issues of race. So, um, you know, one example is that we've been working with um, various clients over the last um, few months on um, on landlord screening of tenants with um, uh, with criminal justice histories, um, both in public housing and in market rate housing, um, and thinking about the impact it has um, if you're screened for criminal history um, by a landlord. And we know that there are populations, both geographic populations and racial populations that are just policed more than other people are. Um, so that's you know, one, one example of, a, of an issue. Um, I think with specific reference to NIMBYism, I've become really pessimistic over the years. Lisa, I read your book in, in college and I feel like maybe it started then. Just, gosh, these people were willing to spend like to bankrupt their city um, rather than see this housing built. Maybe there isn't a hearts and minds approach here. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm with you. I mean, it, it's hard to be cheery after yeah. reading about Yonkers. So one reason that we have a lot, we have a, you know, I, that we have a lot of, land use public hearings in the state of Connecticut that sound like those Yonkers meetings is because we have a state statute that essentially says that suburban communities have got to permit 30% affordable multifamily housing so long as there's no safety or health concerns. You just have to. Um, and if you don't, the developer takes you to court and that's, you know, that's that. Um, uh, so that is an example of saying, look, just at some point, the state's got to take some of these decisions out of local hands, um, because at the local level, it is impossible for a renter who might one day rent a unit in a development that might get built from three years from now, show up at a public hearing to say it's good for them, right? But it is very possible for all of the local homeowners to turn around and say, oh, we don't like this, we're scared of change. Um, so I think that that's a, that's a big part of our legislative strategy and some of our clients' legislative strategy is, is to say the state's got to provide more direction here and not leave all of these choices about where housing gets built to local governments. Agreed. And now we will end with you, Lisa. And what am I doing? I mean, I, I'm a, a journalist who has the luxury of sweeping in and then swooping out. Um, so, you know, as... Yes, part of my heart is in that book, but then there were other books. Um, but I, I hope the book is a small part of a possible solution, perhaps, in the way that stories often are, right? The answer to prejudice, the answer to misconception, the to beliefs that aren't true, is to show people ones that aren't true. So, 
you know, the book is an example of that. The miniseries is an example of that. But far more than both of those, the housing is exists and is proof positive that Yonkers didn't fall apart. Crime rates didn't go up in those neighborhoods. You know, and the, the, the world as the white residents knew it did not end. Um, many good things happened on the white middle-class side of town when these new townhouses were built. Um, other lessons were learned, which is that they didn't take enough care building them. And so they began to fall apart. They didn't do things like put in a back gate. So people had to take the lawnmowers through the house in order to mow the back and the front lawn. I mean, you know, but the housing, um, the housing lives, it exists. And now there are two generations of kids that have grown up in them. So, you know, each encounter that someone has with reality is a good thing. So that's, I guess, my little part of the job. But thank you to you guys for doing a much bigger part of it. Thank you so, so much. Um, wow, this has been such a great and insightful conversation. I'm looking in the chat box and I don't see any questions, but I do see a um see a message from PT Partners. It says the resistance to people who are black and brown asserting themselves occurs at all levels of power and across all races because they are believed poor black and brown. Mostly women slash mothers don't have rights. It's disheartening the resistance we have encountered when we just ask for resources for basic health and safety. And I have to agree with that statement. It's it's sad and alarming the amount of resistance that we see. And you know, getting back to that question that I asked Dion earlier, when the needs of individuals that live in public housing are the same as everyone's. Um, so, seeing no other questions in the chat box. Um, as we come to the end of our evening together, I'm hoping that everyone um, that is present today walks away with a new piece of knowledge or a greater understanding of why it is so important that people have access to safe and stable housing. As organizations and advocates, we do a really good job, fairly good job, with enforcing the Fair Housing Act, right? There are administrative agencies where victims of discrimination can file complaints, and there's a long legacy of case law to support the work that we do. However, the second intention of the Fair Housing Act is to encourage and promote policies that support integration. In Connecticut, especially, we have not found success at reaching the intentions of the Fair Housing Act, largely due to NIMBYism. It's my hope that this conversation will be the springboard for many conversations to come. And I'm not talking about the surface level grant satisfying questions that we all have to answer, but those difficult and uncomfortable ones that force us to look at ourselves and to look at our organizations and ask, are we truly working towards equity? If so, take this as a call to action. May we stop ignoring race and housing policy, but instead make it the bedrock of every conversation, every recovery effort and every piece of policy. With that being said, I wanna thank our wonderful panelists again. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Anika. Thank you, Dion. Thank you, Maribel. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for sharing your experiences and your expertise. And I wanna thank each and every one of you um, that attended this evening. This presentation is recorded. Um, it will be available on our YouTube once I figure out the logistics of uploading it onto YouTube. Um, but once this presentation is uploaded, it will be sent out again. So all will have the opportunity to access this and share it among their social media networks. So that being said, um, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Thank you all and um, have a good evening. And I'll, you know, kick it to our panel to say bye to everyone that has spent time with us this evening. Goodbye and thank, thank you everyone. for having us. Thank, thank you. you for having us and thank everyone for listening. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye.